Welcome back to 10, 10, 10. Today we're looking at the eighth commandment. You shall not steal. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 15. So much of what is wrong in our world stems from the ignoring and the breaking of this commandment. I received an email from a friend in South Africa telling me about their new apartment and extolling all the safety issues. 24-hour security guard, automatic gates, high surrounding wall topped off with razor wire, a reinforced steel cage to park their car in, metal bars over the windows and the balcony, locks on all the windows and doors, infrared alarm system. Fort Knox has nothing on it. Isn't it great, they said. No, I replied to their astonishment. No, how horrible that all of that security is needed to live a normal, safe life. They were so caught up, so numbed by the prevailing society that they had lost sight of what should be normal. Stealing is taking from others without giving in return. Unless you were given it, if you did not work for it or pay for it, you stole it. If we really loved our neighbor as ourselves, we would not steal from them. It is a lack of love that causes us to do these things to each other. To put it in a positive way, our duty by all proper and legal means is to preserve and further both our own and our neighbor's estate. And this requires honesty and uprightness in our dealings with each other. The Eighth Commandment is the only one about possessions, about what we and others own. Stealing is a much more complex problem in our society than it was in the days of ancient Israel. In the ancient world, very tangible objects were stolen, like cattle and property. If something was found in my possession, I couldn't argue that I hadn't taken it. But we now live in an age of sophisticated technology. Ideas are patented, but stolen. Writing is copyright but plagiarized. Songs and movies are pirated and we have identity theft. We are a mass of contradictions. John Lennon's song, Imagine, with its Imagine No Possessions, It's Easy If You Try, was voted the UK's favorite lyric in 1999. But there is not the slightest sign that anyone, least of all rock stars, wants such a creed to be made the basis of serious economic or personal policy. In the Western world, we earn more and own more than any other people at any other time and place in history. And yet we still want more because we've turned our possessions and wealth, we turn to them for fulfillment rather than to the living God. And the problem is that in order to get what we want, many of us have no problem in helping ourselves. The 10th, 9th and 8th commandments, which prohibit coveting, lying and theft, are all linked. It is impossible to want to steal something without breaking the 10th commandment, and it is practically impossible to carry it out without breaking the 9th commandment. We have a flawed understanding of possessions. What the Bible says is stunningly simple and clear. It is not wrong to own things, but the fact is that everything we have comes from God. So ultimately, everything belongs to God. And nothing belongs to us. We have no rights over property or wealth. It's not ours. It's God's. I no more own my house, my car, and my bank balance than I own my library books. They have all, in different ways, been issued to me. They remain the possession of someone else. I have them on temporary loan, and they can be recalled by the rightful owner at any time without warning. And whilst the librarian may smile and say, thank you, God will want to know what I did with all that he lent me. Why should I not steal? Well, simply because God says so. And he really does know what is best for us and for society. The most common reaction of people when their property is stolen is one of offense. That's mine. God reacts in the same way. He is offended by stealing. When we steal, we are stealing from God. If no one stole anything, it would be the best for society and the best for ourselves, too. The best for our relationships, our emotions, our integrity and our well-being. There are four common ways of living which are theft. Common ways. First, taking things that don't belong to us but probably won't be noticed. Taking stamps and stationery and using the photocopier in the workplace. 
they'll never notice. They can afford it. They owe it to me. If you're still this way, then stop doing it right now. Second, long-term borrowing. Books, clothes, tools. It's not that you're meant to steal them. You only borrowed them. But since you've had them so long, you've now stolen them. Give them back right now. Third, deceiving. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 23. The Lord detests differing weights and dishonest scales do not please him. Now, today we don't use weights. We use words. Either to talk ourselves up or our product up or to talk someone else down and steal their reputation. And fourth, defrauding. Withholding something from someone to whom it is rightfully due. Or deferring a bill payment as long as possible. No, we pay up on time. We must do that. You, when you bump another car and then drive away, or defraud the government with an inaccurate tax return, or calling in sick when we are healthy, or even worse, when we're hungover, or padding out our expenses, God calls all of these things stealing. We also steal from ourselves. Everything we have is given to us by God for us to steward wisely, knowing that he will hold us accountable for them. When we squander what God has graciously given to us, our life, our health, our money, our possessions, our job, our family, our salvation, we're really stealing from ourselves. Our time, for example, is a, is a precious commodity. I mentioned it before. We are exhorted in Scripture to redeem the time. When we fail to use our time wisely, we steal valuable events from our own lives. If instead of using our time to pursue the Lord and the things of God, we merely employ it in recreational activities and self-serving events, then we rob ourselves of spiritual life, the blessings of God and the future reward. Jesus gave perspective in Matthew 16, verse 26. And how do you benefit if you gain the whole world? but lose your own soul in the process. Is anything worth more than your soul? We can be so busy building our kingdom that we neglect his kingdom. Are we laying up treasure in heaven or on earth? Some Christians even have the audacity to defraud God. We can steal from God. We can rob God himself. Malachi chapter 3 verse 8. But you ask, how do we rob God? In times, tithes and offerings. Verse 10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Test me in this. Our money is all God's anyway. Amazingly, he lets us keep 90% and he trusts us to use it wisely. He only asks us to give back to him 10% of all we earn. But if we choose not to, we're stealing from God. Why would any believer steal from God? The root of it is that they believe two things. First, their money and their possessions are really yeah, theirs. I owned it. I deserve them. They're not God's. They are mine. Second, if I give them away, I don't believe God will provide for me and my family. So how can we live responsibly and keep the Eighth Commandment? The Bible tells us that God the Father will give us what we need from his limitless resources. But we are expected to do our part with hard, diligent work and faithful, believing prayer. Matthew 7, verse 7, ask and you will receive. We need to be honest about ourselves, about theft, where we stand. We all do it. But very few people are prepared to look at themselves in the mirror and admit, I'm a thief. I've stolen. And then repent to the Lord and make recompense where possible. Remember the high cost of theft. There are costs to society in fear, insecurity, and distrust, as well as in higher prices, elevated taxes, and reduced social services. There are great mental and emotional costs to the victims, and there are costs to those who steal. Things that are illegally gained provide little lasting satisfaction or pleasure to those who get them. By its very nature, theft cannot satisfy. The thief will always want more. How can we break any hold that stealing has in our lives? 
First, strive against your selfishness by actively seeking to help those you might have defrauded. An extreme example of this is Zacchaeus the tax collector in Luke 19. He was a thief, that came with a job, but when he met with the love and forgiveness of Jesus, his life and attitudes changed. Verse 8, if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. The Eighth Commandment is one of the few commandments where we can make restitution for the things we've done wrong. Second, stand firm against the desire to place your security in your money or possessions rather than in God. How? By cheerfully and generously giving to those in need. Back to Zacchaeus again, verse 8. Here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor. Every act of giving is an act of rebellion against a life dominated by possessions or wealth. If we've made a practice of regular giving, it is easier to resist the temptation to steal. If you've not acquired the habit of giving, I urge you to start right now. However much we give away, God has always given us far more. If we're to be like him, then we too should be generous. Finally, consider Jesus. No one ever accused Jesus of stealing, although he always seemed to be surrounded by thieves, even at his death. It is clear to all that he was a giver. His primary aim? To give his life as a ransom, so that we might receive life in all its fullness, and eternal life as well.